Welcome to The Third Story. I'm Leo Sidrin. And this is In Dublin, the first song from Billy Martin's latest solo record, Guilty. Actually, I think the song title is really pronounced like this. Dublin. That's one of the countless classic bits from the original mockumentary, This is Spinal Tap. You know, if you know, then you know. Spinal Tap, at this point, I think is canon. It's required viewing if you're serious about a life as a musician because it just operates as code, shorthand, common ground even, among other musicians. It's got those classic riffs like this one goes to 11, Stonehenge, Big Bottom, None More Black, and the spontaneously combusting drummer. The exploding drummer is actually probably the most appropriate for us here today because Billy Martin is, among other things, perhaps best known as not a combustible drummer, but rather a drummer of explosive spontaneity, creativity, sensitivity, curiosity, and groovaciousness. Look it up. It's a word. Billy Martin is many things. He's a visual artist, a filmmaker, a teacher, a builder, a father, a composer. Apparently he's a bass player now, too, because he plays pretty much everything you hear on this track. And he's respected in all these various disciplines. But if you know his name, chances are it's from his band Modesky, Martin & Wood, a project that he's had for 30 years now, along with bassist Chris Wood and keyboardist John Modesky. The band is known for deeply funky grooves, very accessible and fun to listen to, a kind of searching and creative spirit, sometimes described as an avant jazz funk group because they bring together elements of the avant-garde and a high level of groovitude. Also a word. I've always felt a certain level of humor in the band's approach. Billy refers to it as playfulness, and he's committed to the idea of play and experimentation in art. What I discovered in our conversation is that he's also totally serious. He's a serious thinker, and he takes enormous care with what he does and how he does it. He might be playing, but he's not messing around. I think you'll hear the intensity, the level of deliberation and thoughtfulness coming from him and how both of us really stayed in that lane for the duration of our talk. Billy Martin is not self-taught exactly. In fact, he's basically a lifelong student, but his path has been somewhat self-directed. He spent his formative musical years taking lessons at the Drummers Collective in New York, where he came into contact with a group of musicians who would shape his music and his career, and where he got what he calls the inside stuff. Notably, he refers to drummer and composer Bob Moses as one of his primary mentors. And he made a documentary film about 10 years ago with another of his early teachers, Alan Herman. That movie, Life on Drums, is a series of discussions between Billy and Alan, intercut with solo drum performances by both of them, and it's a really compelling project. I have wanted to talk to Billy Martin for a long time, and this conversation was well worth the wait. We spoke recently about how field recording influenced him, the power of sincerity in art and in life, the importance of staying curious and being playful, what he calls the, quote, world music view, and how when you're experimenting, there's no such thing as perfection. This conversation aligns nicely with a series of previous episodes, like the one with Michael League from Snarky Puppy, who also espoused a kind of world music view when we spoke last year. Or pianist Kenny Werner, who's one of the most outspoken advocates for a kind of playful exploration in improvised music. Or drummer Dave King, another freewheeling improviser whose love of visual art, architecture, and art theory have informed his journey. All of those conversations and nearly 200 more are available for your enjoyment and perusal at third-story.com. Get into it and get groovalicious. Also a thing. This week on the website, you will find, as is the custom, a curated Spotify playlist based on our talk and a gallery of some of my favorite Billy Martin videos. Also find all the socials and the link to my Patreon page. That's patreon.com slash third story podcast, where you can support the podcast on a deeper level. I think you know what I mean. Here's me and Billy Martin talking it down. Billy Martin. As I talk to you right now, you are holding a microphone that you bought recently, as you explained to me before we started rolling, both to be able to do interviews like this one, but also to do more environmental recording. Environmental recording is already something that's part of your output. And as a matter of fact, it reminds me that of your most recent releases that you put out in the last year on your Bandcamp page, the newest one is in fact not a traditional musical statement. In fact, it's a, 
an hour-long recording of a rainstorm that you made in the tea house uh, behind your house, I think it is. It's a structure that you built on your property. Yeah, it's in the back, way in the backyard, yeah. When I heard it, it reminded me of an experience that I had a long time ago. Years ago, I was lying in a hotel room. I I think maybe I, I woke up to the sound of what I was convinced was a drummer of one floor above me playing on a snare drum. And it was some of the hippest, most creative solo snare drumming I, I had ever heard. It was, <laughs> it seemed like it was totally freely crossing the bar line. I could definitely hear a pulse through it and a tempo through it. And, you know, I, I have a part of my life where I play drums. So I was listening to that thinking, man, I want to play like this. I want to be free like this cat. And finally I got out of bed and opened the window and realized that it was the sound of rain hitting a drain pipe outside of my window. And it was a very uh, revealing moment for me to try to channel that sense of nature in music. Beautiful. It's amazing that you hear that. I think that's one of the things that I pay attention to is like the sounds, the rhythms and the sounds from nature and the environment. I mean, not just natural and unnatural that kind of inform me, you know. And I've always I've always had um, ambitions to to release a lot more environmental recordings. And the first thing I ever did, it was the second release on my, you know, my own label, Amulet Records, was a recording of Rain Sticks. It was eight tracks of an hour long, eight different Rain Stick performances. It was a bamboo Rain Stick that I bought in, the, in Soho in the store in Bira. I'm all about environmental recording. I hope to do more. Um, I'm also into field recording. I've I've really learned a lot from field recordings, whether it might be Alan Lomax or Verna Gillis or these people who, a lot of other people, uh, Europeans, French people, Belgian people who went to you know different parts of their colonies, you know, in Africa and different you know parts of Africa, the Caribbean, uh, United States, Asia, Southeast Asia. All of that stuff is really important, you know, real great documents of folkloric music that I've learned a lot from. That's a half of, 50% of my education is just listening to records, you know, field recordings of uh, folk music. How would we recognize some of that influence in what we know of your playing? Well, I think, I mean, simply put, you know, being a drummer, you'll hear some rhythmic language of West Central African drumming, Brazilian you know, Brazilian drumming, uh, rhythms, gamelan, you know, Indonesian stuff, like all those things that I listen to, I have studied, it's just become part of my musical vocabulary. So you'll hear it, and you'll hear it in my drumming in particular, but also in my writing, in my composing, and how I interact with other musicians, like I'm just open to, it's, you know, it's the world, kind of whole world view, world music view of, of things now. It's like yeah. even more, more important than ever to communicate in any musical language with people. I'm, I'm not, I don't sit in a, in a room and, and just play one style with a people who play the same style. I'm not into that. You've been influenced by field recording and the idea of capturing the moment, and that informs a lot of what you do. But you're also no stranger to making records and to the recording studio. The records that you've made, both with Medeski Martin Wood, your solo records, a lot of other projects, have been very cultivated, thoughtful records. What is the interaction like for you? Do you see them as different? Are they related? Are there elements of both that you try to pull from when you're in the studio capturing a moment versus manufacturing a moment, let's say? Yeah, I think there's two, you know, there's two answers. Yes and no. I mean, yes in that, you know, to me, everything is just capturing the moment of your performance. And for me, it's about performance. It's about capturing a good performance a good impro- uh, an improvisation that you created something in the moment or just a good performance of something you've been like developing. Uh, with Mendesi Martin Wood, it's been both of those things famously, I think, that mentioning that Mendesi Martin Wood is kind of a great, you know, idea of that. But I, I do believe I've been a real strong proponent of recording on location. So mm. bringing the studio to the space to me has always been from early on to me, like a really crucial benefit to capturing, you know, a performance. Just like, for example, going to Hawaii and recording Shack Man in the Shack, we call it the Shack, and it is literally a, a, 
a wooden shack with screens on one side and glass on the other and tin roof. And there's something about playing there with John and Chris over the couple of years before and starting to realize we're getting, and I was recording with a DAT machine and two Mm -hmm. really good mics that my dad had. And I just was like, we got to record this stuff. And some of it ended up, a little bit it ended up on some records before. And then we decided, and I pushed it as well, like, let's just record a record here. proved to work um it was very challenging and then going into the studio i feel like yes it is you know the studio is kind of a tool in itself and some studios just have a certain their equipment the sound of the room is special where it's located where the restaurants are you know what the vibe is in the neighborhood can really influence the experience so i also think that's really crucial as well you know so Mm -hmm. But I do see that I, in general, as I get older and have more experience, I'm seeing it all as it's all good. It's all good. And it's all pretty much just capturing a performance. You say as you get older, you're seeing it as all good. Do you think you had sort of more strongly held convictions about what was and wasn't good when you were younger? Yeah, well, of course. Yeah. I mean, as far as recording goes, I was very intimidated by the recording studio going into a recording studio and, and maybe working with engineers I didn't know and people around me that I I didn't even know who they were. All of a sudden, I'm there with even with a band of friends that we're recording with, but it's still, it, it affects us. We get We feel maybe a little insecure because all of a sudden, you know, it's like the microscopes. <laughs> They're putting microscopes over our instruments, you know, microscopes, you know what I mean? Like the mm-hmm. microphones, but I like to call, we, sometimes uh, we, we used to say we're microscoping too much, which means we're analyzing, way over analyzing. We can hear every little detail and it's driving us crazy. So sometimes you feel like, you know, people are looking at us through this lens. So I was kind of like, fuck that, man. Like, let's just record in a freaking warehouse, you know? Let's record in the basement of the place that we were rehearsing, which we called Shacklin. Mm-hmm. No, Shacklin. Yeah, Shacklin, because there's Shaxton. Okay, Shacklin is in Brooklyn, in mm-hmm. Dumbo. And Shaxton is in Kingston, where <laughs> we moved uh, and recorded a couple of things as well. And I, for me, it was always about being really ind- as independent as we could be and feel really comfortable in... And and then then just document that. So I did. I was kind of like, man, I'm not really so into like paying all this money to be in a studio and then like feeling uncomfortable in there and intimidated. But that's that's gone away a lot, a lot more. But it still does influence you when you walk in there, and you could be someone there who's just like, it's not, you're not comfortable around that person, you know. And all of a sudden, you're like, that might affect you if you're a sensitive person, you know. So I was kind of like, I was different in that way. I had a lot of attitude problems. I was definitely, I had a strong feeling about a lot of things when I was younger, you know, about what I thought was cool, what wasn't cool and all that shit. The stories that you tell of Modesky Martin and Wood going into nature, getting out of the noise of the city, creating a certain amount of self-isolation in order to be able to focus and, and create, suggest a kind of aversion to city life. But in fact, you are a New Yorker. There's another part of your life and your experience that is very tied to New York. Not only did the band come together in the downtown scene in New York in the early 90s, but also your parents were both members of the New York creative community. You're a total New Yorker. Definitely. Oh, no. I mean, this for me, the, the urban, you know, growing up in New York City, the first 12 years of my life, it was in New York City and you know, hundred, uh, 200 Street, you know, it's just in, they call it Inwood, right? Yeah. 200 and Broadway and yeah. Dykeman Street and all that. And it's like, it was a rough, you know, West Side Story kind of neighborhood, like, you know, and I loved it. As a kid, you're not, you're kind of, I don't know, I wasn't so fearful. I kind of like, but that 
stayed with me. I moved to New Jersey. My parents moved to New Jersey, bought a house right across the river. Very different life. It was like suburban kind of like, you know, life. Then I moved to Brooklyn with a girlfriend who was going to SVA art school and we moved into a loft in Dumbo and it was very different. And that was 85. Mm. Uh, and I was going into the city a lot in the in the, in the late 70s and early 80s, like um, whether it was going clubbing, like dancing at Studio 54 or, you know, Heartbreak or, you know, Dance Ateria or the Roxy or, you know, skating at the Roxy or um, studying at the Drummers Collective and meeting Bob Moses, Jaco Pastorius, Bill Frizzell, Mike Gibbs, Mike Stern. You know, all these people were, were like coming into this place. I don't know why, but they were, they were around. It was where I met Bob Moses, one of my mentors. So all I'm saying, I'm painting a picture of like the experience of being around New York City. And definitely, I feel very strongly about being a native New Yorker. I love New York City. I always will. Whatever changes it goes through, it's really important to me. And I also feel that there's an urban vibe, you know, that's, that's there in the Modesto Martin Wood music because mm. we're all, we've all some ways been part of it we've all come from different parts of the united states like john from florida chris from colorado in general they were in boston at nec i was in new york they moved down to new york and then we got together we lived they lived in the east village i lived in dumbo for those pretty much like 10 years like since nine nine you know in the 90s and just kind of like that was our home base and uh that influenced us in ways but we were also very much into nature Mm. And going to Hawaii and um, going to the Berkshires. We had a friend in the Berkshires that we, we loved to visit. And he had a farm and his, his family was growing up on the farm. And we would hang and play there and eat great food and get away, you know. And, and, and we really cherish that kind of going somewhere remote uh, or somewhere in nature, you know, to get the balance, you know, of things. That idea of getting the balance, especially in that group, I think is what you alluded to before that, you know, Medeski Martin Wood famously kind of played it on both ends, that it came out of the avant-garde, but it also was deeply committed to the groove, you know, and that these things could happen at the same time. When you started playing together and putting it together, how did that language develop? Yeah, it was it was a gradual process. Initially, we didn't really talk at all we just played we jammed and it was just like getting that out like communicating each other with like showing off what we could do and listening to each other and then over time it was like i've got this idea you know i'm just saying collectively yeah. or separately we would just have ideas and we would respect each other enough to kind of like let each of us kind of go through and we would get behind the ideas uh, and sometimes it was like playing you know an arrangement of caravan and just like doing it our way Other times where it was like John would just say, "Can you and Chris just play like not roam around freely and just groove simply for a really long time and just let me figure out how I can do this because I don't really I really want to like develop." So he was very specific, asked us to do that, and that's one specific thing that I felt was like mm. actually initially a pain in the ass for me because I was just like I want to play free because I was basically more of a groove drummer and less of a free drummer hmm. uh, and I was kind of like finally I'm playing with guys that can go anywhere whether it's like playing with Sun Ra or Ned or Cecil Taylor whatever might have the, the what I thought you know I was doing with them I had the freedom now and then John's saying no could you please groove because you groove so great and I was at first like, no, I was not, not, no, I was like, yeah, we can do that. But I was like, oh my God, like this is ours. And what I learned from that and what Chris did too, there's so much nuance 
with grooving, like keeping the pulse, keeping a tempo, maybe gradually morphing into other grooves and like figuring out the nuance of grooving while he's figuring out how do I fit melody and what do I do here? Like how are I just, just working things out? Um, and that's just one of many examples, you know, like initially it was like John just transcribed what we jammed on a few things and wrote some charts. We had some horns come in and then we also did, you know, arrangements, you know, we did like a monk thing, uh, you know, Bemsha swing with the Bob Marley thing, Bemsha swing and lively up yourself, you know, like those kind of clever ideas. Motimo, like I, you know, I turn the band on to, hey, let's, you know, let's listen to, you know, listen to this King Sunny Eye Day tune. I love it so much. Like, can we find a way to play it? And uh, so then this is just like years and years and years of just trying things and then moving on from them too. Like the, the evolution of how we work together was what it was about. And we made pretty much almost from the beginning, we were like, we have to keep evolving. We can't make the same record twice. We can't, we have to keep just inventing. That was what kept us excited. Medeski Martin Wood made a concerted, decision made a collective decision to be a band and although there are plenty of examples in improvised music of bands like that it's not so common it's more common for the music to sort of exist under the heading umbrella of one leader the artist and the sidemen there are no sidemen in Medeski Martin Wood everybody is the leader it's it's a co-op thing why did the three of you decide to approach it that way that was definitely part of the, the, the evolutionary process because when we went when we first got together I was just so blown away and enamored by John in particular. John was like the first person I met. I didn't meet Chris till a little bit later. So when I met John and we decided to just play some duets in my loft in, in Dumbo, and the hell that was, 90, 91, you know, I had just been like, this guy's incredible. So like when Chris came along, he was very supportive, but I think Chris and I didn't feel like leaders you know and mm. john didn't really either he didn't want to mm. be a leader so he let us know that pretty much right away but i was like we need a name for the band you know i was very much pro you know like about make being independent and making our own demos or records and so i was like we need a name for the band and i was always kind of thinking about some a vision you know like record covers and you know stuff like that and uh, i was like john medeski <laughs> john medeski trio you know and he was like no i don't want my name and over time, we, we realized this is a collective thing. But it took, you know, it took about six months to a year to kind of realize this is a collective thing. You know, there's no leader. Uh, it's a democratic process where we just all are responsible. It's a band, right? So um, that's very different. I don't, I don't, you know, I never thought of it as, as radical at the time. I mean, I, of course, I thought I knew in deep down in my bones that this was a really special important thing that people needed to hear this but that's mm. just a young passionate guy who really believes in the music but i did feel like this is different this is this is very different and we're all side men coming in to form a band together so at a certain point we were like we defined it it's like there's no leader and we're all working on this together and and that was it from that point on we were just like contributing song you know songwriting composing together does that did that answer your question <laughs> sure uh, anything you say answers my question for some reason a band is a kind of um easier to digest in the mainstream sometimes and 
as you guys were developing this language, there was this other sort of cultural phenomenon that was playing out on college campuses all over the country, which was this kind of emergence of the jam scene. And once again, you kind of threaded the needle in, in and out of that world. But there was a huge audience that discovered Medeski, Martin & Wood that were fans of jam band music and slotted you in in between Fish and even The Grateful Dead, you know, that you kind of entered the mainstream in that way. Yeah, I, you know, we didn't really consciously plan or have any kind of, you know, marketing or any kind of like idea. I mean, we got out there and we played and there were people taping our shows and we allowed taping and even videotaping. And I'm so happy we did that because recently in November, I had a five-week program for Creative Music Studio and uh, we had Modesti Martin Wood as part of the five-week program. It was 90 minutes a week. Uh, every week for 90 minutes, John and Chris and I would get on like a Zoom situation and people would hang out and listen and ask us questions and we would talk about our process. And I prepared for that by digging through our archives. And fortunately, we had some filmmakers a few years ago wanting to make a documentary about us. And so I basically sent a shipped a box to them of all kinds of formats of videotapes, mm. you know, and things, you know, that, that were laying around, whether it was uh, our own personal recordings of ourselves or people who were filming us from the audience or like, you know, the Conan O'Brien show or whatever. And like w what we, what we found was all, so, ha so, and in having people, kind of document us and being open about it like enabled us to look back and see how things were and how important it was to, sh to be open about letting people document us you know so we were mm -hmm. able to sort of like really find some interesting things that happened that weren't planned you know sometimes when you plan oh we're going to tape we're going to film this thing and <laughs> it we don't you don't have such a great performance because there's so much preparation involved so much extra work cameras all over but then there are these other things that are like holy shit like we were crazy the stuff that we were doing and especially in like knoxville tennessee at this place called loose yields there's a whole they did a whole local televised thing you know we have those tapes it's amazing thanks for watching tonight's live at loose yields an evening of jazz if you like tonight's show please let your local public television station hear from you. distinction between the impulse to let yourself be documented and to want to protect it and own it you know there were so many jazz musicians over the years that were so wary of being taped because there was a legacy of being exploited that people would tape them and sell these things or that they didn't feel that they had control over their careers and it is one of the values in this sort of the jam community was that people taped that was one of the defining features of the sort of the jam world was that people would tape and document everything. Yeah, it's a whole subculture that existed back in the Grateful Dead days, I learned, you know, they call them tape heads, right? I think they call them tape tapers, yeah. you know, and they yeah. the Grateful yeah. Dead culture where they would trade and, and just make available to people who are really so obsessed with like the concerts that they missed or the mi concerts that they went to that there weren't any published records to access that there were the audience had a whole subculture of people, of tapers. So that phenomenon, that cult subculture exists, you know, was, was, was around uh, in places like Nashville and Knoxville and Atlanta and like Chicago and really anywhere in the United States that we went, even in Europe, you know, there were some people, some expatriates that were like also tapers that like, would record us in Europe and they would share it, you know, on these tape trees, they call them and the internet. And what we didn't, we didn't, you know, this wasn't a plan. This was just something that happened. We were just open about it. We were, you know, just like, we can't really stop people from taping us. And we're not like, it's not sake. If, we, if we're going to like, be, everything's going to be so sacred, like, you know, how are you going to, you know, all the controlling aspect of it and ego involved with controlling this stuff was just not important to us. So it led to, you know, a grassroots free campaign of like, who the hell are these guys, you know, and check this out. 
And we were the phenomenon, you know, we were like, here's some different stuff. You know, I have this dead stuff. I have this fish stuff. I have Grateful Dead. I have Sun Ra, Manessi Martin Wood, you know, and a lot of other stuff too. You know, I can't name all of, but like they were sharing this stuff. And I, 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 I really did have something to do with like communicating who we were, where we were, what we were doing, documenting it and having a real testament to like how we were developing and the songs that weren't titled and all of that, you know, kind of uh, debates going on about what song we were playing and huh. really interesting subculture. You said something earlier about the Drummers Collective when you were first coming up in New York and hanging out around all of those mentors like Bob Moses. And a big part of your philosophy about teaching is private lessons and mentorship. Can you talk a little bit about what that kind of mentorship meant to you when you were developing and how you have used it to approach your teaching? Looking back, you know, I wasn't aware of mentorships or what that meant, but I was just taking private lessons. When I moved to New Jersey from New York City in 1974, 75, I started taking lessons with this guy, Alan Herman, in New York City. So my dad would drive me in once a week. Uh, My dad was you know, violinist, he was playing the New York City Ballet, City Opera, like, all the time in Lincoln Center. So he was commuting all the time, and he had no problem, like, taking me to my lessons. And that was the beginning of this encouragement for me to study privately. Uh, It wasn't like that my dad really thought private lessons and mentorships is the way to go. It just kind of defaulted into that. It's like, you take, you know, when you take private lessons, you know, you're take piano, whatever your instrument is, you can't get it usually in public school. And he set me up with with Alan Herman through some people that he knew, he heard about. And um, that was the beginning of having this trust in a private one-on-one lesson. And that grew from studying with Alan to four other drummers privately until I went to Drummers Collective and studied with like five different teachers instead of going to college my dad basically encouraged me to just whatever education I want, if it's lessons, he said, I'm, I'm like, you know, I put your bro- brothers through college. That's what I'm going to do for you through education. So if you're not going to college then um, and you want to study privately, why don't you just, I'm taking care of it. And he gave me the green light and so that when I went to Drummers Collective, I wasn't like just studying one drummer a week. It was like studying with five drummers or five different musicians sometimes it wasn't a drummer was a percussionist or you know what I learned was that I was getting this very important kind of intimate relationship going encouragement and just really inside stuff that you don't get in a classroom I mean some classrooms and some master classes the teacher can be very outspoken and very, you know, frank about things. But like when you're with an individual and they have a specific experience and they see who you are and what you have, you know, it's not a sea of students. It's one, you see how someone plays, you see what their issues are, their problems are, maybe their limitations, maybe they're in what, how they're inhibited in a way or their talents. And that, is not something you get easily in a classroom or a college. So I feel like that's really important. It also has to do with their experience. What specialized experience did they have? And how deep can you go with that when you're spending an hour a week with them, maybe more? So what I learned was that, like, I was getting, getting to know them and getting to understand, like, you know, the chemistry that I that we had, you know, uh, the encouragement that they gave me that was specialized. It might have been very interesting stuff. Like it was like studying my later years in high school, I was starting to get deeply into classical music. So my dad happened to know this guy, Paul Price. And Paul Price was the number one percussion ensemble conductor leader that worked with, I didn't even know this then, but he worked very closely with John Cage, presented a lot of his work and did a lot of like really pioneering in the percussion ensemble world. So what he saw in me was not like an orchestral player, even though that's what I wanted to be. He saw a composer and another kind of like opportunity for me that he felt even was lacking in the world. And that was an encouragement I got that, you know, it was sort of like, I'm not going to teach you, like, in a way, he was almost like, you're not really a 
you know, it's like you're not going to be an orchestral percussionist. You got something else going on here. So write a percussion ensemble and I'll premiere it, you know. And mm. I, I did that and it was amazing, you know, like to have that encouragement to feel like, oh my God, I can be a composer. And then there were other people like studying with Frankie Malabé or Michael Carvin. The Frankie Malabé at Drummers Collective was like, you know, Afro-Cuban drumming, but Caribbean stuff too. It was like, you know, merengue from the Dominican Republic, Haitian stuff, Santeria stuff, you know, all kinds of different like subcultures within the African diaspora and the Caribbean. And then there was Michael Carvin who was like, play me a, drum, play me a solo, was first lesson. And like just having that like one-on-one -on -one stuff uh, and then later meeting Bob Moses, and that was just by chance. Uh, M Bob Moses came to the same samba class that I was in. It was a Brazilian samba class, you know. I, I wanted to learn about samba, and I got really deeply, deeply into it. And he showed up as just to hang out and check it out, because he, he was writing some, some music. He wanted some Brazilian percussion. And then he took me under his wing. It wasn't like I sought him out. I didn't know who he was. I just, by default, he became my mentor because he was just basically like, hey, kid, and you're great. You know how to play this Brazilian stuff. And uh, he just liked something about me. And then he ended up taking me everywhere, playing on gigs, helping him produce things. Of course, I set up his drums. I carried things. You know, we ate together. I hung out with, sat with him and Steve Swallow talking about Billie Holiday and Keith Jarrett and you know, and then him introducing me to Bill Frizzell, Eddie Gomez, Stan Lee, like all these people, Danny Gottlieb, you know, like Pat Metheny. I met all those people and worked with them with through Bob Moses. And that was like being an intern, you know. So that mentorship was like you work, you help him get his job done and you also you participate in the maybe in the music, which I did a lot. He always said, hey, OK, go in there and let's play your percussion, you know. And so that, to me, is really been my journey and tried and true. Like, this stuff works. If you can find your mentor, if you can find a teacher, do it, you know? So I want to be that, that person for other people. Do you find that you're able to, to be that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And people come and go because I, I don't pressure anybody. I don't know. I just feel like in the traditional sense, I don't know whatever that means, but like, you know, when you study with someone or you go to a music store or whatever it is, it's like you sign up for a program where you, <laughs> it's like some kind of business deal you make, some contract, like, okay, you're going to have you know, your parents like agree to like, okay, you're going to have like three months of lessons and you're going to pay in in advance. And that is bullshit. Like, I'm like, come with me for one lesson. And I'll give you enough to work on for, for a year. Like, you know, like you don't have to come back. But if you do come back in a month, if you want to do five weeks in a row, of course, you're going to like grow quickly and I'm going to work with you and I'm going to like give you the attention and everything. So there's no pressure. So people come and go. Some people stay for years. And it's been incredible. Uh, I've had lots of great students that have gone on to play with great music and do great things and find themselves, you know. Sometimes I think that what is happening in music education today is that there's still a conception about education in the United States that if you interact or partake in the transaction of education, which is I'm going to give this institution this money and they're going to prepare the student for a career, it just doesn't work necessarily in music because music doesn't operate that way commercially. The fact that you have a, a higher education doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to work. Yeah, it's a big issue that I feel needs to be addressed. And I think it has been in some ways. And in other ways, it's just been like, you know, the status quo, you know, uh, people coming into a, an established, you know, prestigious institution and the parents mostly hopeful that their child yeah. is going to get the best and they're going to be able to use that as a calling card to get work. My thing is like beware of that kind of getting status or going to a prestigious school if you don't really if you're not really ready yet or sure or have a, your own a strong feeling of your own. I think it's great if you are privileged enough to get thrown into college go <laughs> and just meet friends and maybe you're going to find that one teacher or that one class that's going to just open you up. I didn't have that experience. I, I mean, I had those experiences more with private lessons, but I did have some experiences with, with 
uh, classes, even in high school, like one or two teachers that, you know, turned me on to being an artist, basically. That's what I responded to. And it took 10 or even 20 years, you know, 10 years after high school, 20 even, to realize I am an artist and I am the author of what I do. And I, I'm creating my own language and even my own philosophy and my own mythology, you know, like, mm. because I think when you're, when you're an artist, you're a visionary and you have a vision you want to express and you have to create this world for people. And it can go from music to visual art, to poetry, to architecture. I mean, you know, all these things are expressive art. So the seed was planted in high school with that one teacher, Dr. Sharatsky. That was the beginning for me. I feel like some people just, they want to play music. I think there's like being an orchestral musician or being in a Broadway pit or playing on a cruise ship, playing weddings is totally fine. If you can make a living doing that and you love it, great. I mean, some colleges are going to help you with that. Others won't. You have to just be independent and create your own career. I just feel like there's not, there hasn't been much encouragement for people to be their own author, to be, to be the artist. Like That's where we're lacking in education. What you just described is really basically a, a broad stroke description of your own career because you are a visual artist also and you make films and you're interested in architecture and, and in building things also. There is this real sense of freedom about not being boxed in. Technically, it's very different to be a visual artist than it is to be a drummer. But I guess internally, I mean, is it the same impulse that is driving you to create visual art and to perform? Absolutely. It's the same impulse coming from the same place. It's just the technical part of it is just, you know, how do I build a sculpture? You know, how do I build a form in music with sound? You know, it's like, okay, well, you know, you can, you don't really need much more than just to make sound and then just maybe, and then if you want to share it, you've got to record it and capture it so you can share it with people. And with building, it's like you got to understand, well, am I going to use glue? Am I going to use screws? Am I, you know, what kind of material am I going to use? And, and then making a movie is like, to me, the ultimate expression because you're dealing with such, such multiple dimensions of, you know, sound, words, if there are words, images, and it's all compositional. But it really is coming from an impulse. For me, personally, it's coming from the performative improvisation of course if you want to build something like a house or a sculpture sometimes you have to like visualize it and write it down sketch it out and then experiment with like what materials make a model or just go for it and that's kind of how I go about it because you need to measure you need to kind of have a drawing of what it is sometimes though I can just literally cut up pieces of wood and just hammer them and glue them together and make just an, an abstract sculpture or a little light box. And I don't have to use much. I don't have to sketch it out always, you know. It's like building blocks when you're playing in a kid, you know. But other times you have to be very specific. And it's the same with music. And it's the same with poetry. It's the same with filmmaking. Like, you can improvise your way through and be very much performative and capture things and then go back and maybe edit it later, you know. So I really feel like it's like very very similar in that way is the impulse to just create something, have a vision or be in the moment and start, mm -hmm. you know, dancing, you know, really. I love that. I, I have had a series of conversations for this podcast about where composition and improvisation or where improvisation and composition kind of meet and overlap and how even if you compose something over a long period of time and you edit it and you revise it and you think about it. I mean, at the, the spark of everything has to come from an improvisation. It ha at least I believe that it starts with something. You have to put something on the page in order to be able to deal with it. And I love the idea that the same could be true in construction and certainly in three-dimensional art, but even in constructing something that you can improvise your way through it. Being in the moment to me is like, you know, goes pretty far back, you know, a couple of decades of me like professing like being in the moment is really my favorite place to be and the possibilities there and experimenting experimental nature of things to me is also really important especially when I teach because uh, when you're experimenting you don't have to have 
a successful or perfection. It's just about like trying something and it either works or it doesn't. And there's no, uh, with experiment, with the word experimental, like experimental music or experimental artist, there's no style attached. You know, it's not a genre. Even though people are trying to, to you know, like some people think experimental music is a genre. Hmm. It's not. You talked about some of this in the documentary film that you made about 10 years ago, Life on Drums. And one of the things that stayed with me from that film is when you talked about honesty in your playing. And you said, you know, you you really make a point with your students of encouraging them to be honest. You might make a mistake, you might not, but that's not what it's about. If you share yourself honestly in performance, then it will always be an accurate and true uh, representation of who you are. And there's, of course, only one of you in the world. So it will always be unique. Yeah, and it's about being sincere. So that if you're sincere and honest with who you are, the mistake is accepted because it's who you are. Mm -hmm. And that is a liberating, you know, that's a whole part is to liberate people from like feeling like they did a bad thing or it was wrong and don't do that again. You know, that kind of thing that we learn as we get conditioned. And it's like, you're not intentionally trying to do something bad. You know, you're just being yourself. And it's an honest mistake. And you shouldn't feel bad about it. And you should feel good about being sincere and truthful and honest because it is giving of yourself that you're doing. It's a sacrifice you're making as opposed to hiding behind a mask and being this facade, you know. Uh, and it's not good for anybody. You know, I think that's really important. And I think ultimately I, what, I, what I experience with a lot of students is that they're uptight about being judged and sure. they're very much down on themselves and afraid to open up and, you know, just be out there vulnerable, you know. But it's not about, it's not, you don't have to be vulnerable. If you're being sincere, it takes the vulnerability away. And Interesting. Sincerity and vulnerability are not the same thing. It's not the same thing to be vulnerable and to be sincere. No, yeah, it's, they're different. I, I feel strongly that they are. And when you're, when you're not feeling vulnerable, when you're not intimidated by yourself or other people, it's liberating and also that's where things happen. That's where the growth, that's where yeah. the real growing happens, the real blossoming of the flower happens. Like things that happen that you never thought you could do. Is opening that up. It's and it's not a free like eh, you know, loosey goosey thing. It's a focus. You know, that's the other thing I have to tell people. That's like just being, you know, sincere and free in your playing is not, <laughs> is not a weak, weird, avant garde thing. It's a focus of like yeah. what is what signal are you getting right now? You know, and just strike it. You know. Well, I, I think that's why I was reminded of that moment in the film where you talk about sincerity when you brought up the idea of being in the moment because sincerity is something that is developed as a person, not as only as a musician, but as, I mean, in order to be sincere about what you mean and who you are, you kind of have to have confronted yourself or, or accepted yourself, know yourself, not technically, but really internally. In the same way, I think in order to be in the moment, you kind of have to be comfortable with yourself to surrender to the moment. Are there techniques that you've developed or have you, do you have a practice of any kind or anything that ha has helped you develop that commitment to the moment and that commitment to being a sincere person? The philosophy is to be playful in what you're doing so that the possibility of like something happening. So in other words, a child is playful mm -hmm. uh, and I'm going to give credit to Carl Berger, you know, who, really said this. It's no different than being a child, you know, when you're a child in the sandbox and there's a uninhibited playfulness that you're you're in this thing and you may be in it just for a minute, for five minutes, and half of it is completely like you don't know what you're doing. You're just doing it. And that that's the part of being like back to the child, uninhibited, unconditioned playfulness. And if you can do that in any creative or work situation, it can apply to anything. In music What's working for me is getting on the piano, which is an instrument that I do not, I have not been trained. I do not, I'm not, I took a couple of lessons when I was very young and it was the wrong teacher. But um, over the years, over the past 10 years, I have pianos around because I need to compose and find things, 
particularly I got it because of film score work that I was getting and I wanted just some other melodic harmonic sound besides the imbiras and the balafones and the xylophones and the vibraphones or whatever. And then I started getting string instruments too, like a mandolin, a ban toy banjo, and now I have a bass ukulele and I've been playing around with bass and of course all of the synthesizers you can plug into your, you know, to your live Ableton or Logic or whatever. But it's the piano for me has been an incredible teacher because you just put your hands down and you're going to have a certain vibration frequencies happening and you're also can express yourself rhythmically and do phrasing. So as a drummer, as like all these years of like understanding rhythm, music, expressing myself with rhythm and dynamics, all of that exploration I've done on the drum set and that creative sort of approach to improvising is now applied on the piano without knowing what chord I'm playing or what, you know, if there's a mode or it's a key, but it's just using my ear. So the process of practicing this you know, being sincere is just to let everything go and be open to every sound and to not judge it, but be focused and shape it as you go along using silence, using phrase, trying all these different things. Play a little one to three minute piece with a beginning and an end. Stop. Play something completely different than that. Hmm. Stop. Play another thing that's different than that. Like how many different ways can you play the piano? It's endless with any instrument this could be applied but what i guess what i'm saying is the practice of it is maybe mm -hmm. you know explore making sound on an instrument that you are not familiar with that you've never touched before or you rarely touch and try to shape it into something and just be sincere about making the sound and and let the technique go like follow whatever you do whatever you can possibly can technically that's it and when it comes to visual arts, would you encourage people to do the same thing? Just put a line on the page, just start somewhere and respond? Yep, yeah, it's that simple. Just make a mark, you know, instead of making sound, make a mark and then make another mark. And then, you know, just follow your impulse to kind of give it shape, give it form. Does it need to be balanced out? You know, I find myself often kind of like, balancing it within the frame you know and is it symmetrical or asymmetrical a lot of times asymmetrical balance is what i'm i'm going for just that's my aesthetic do you think that that carries over this is what i was thinking about before we started talking today the, the idea of rhythm in visual art the idea that everything has rhythm you know and that we all have our own sense of rhythm is there rhythm in visual art there's patterns, you know, and of course you can use the metaphor rhythm. Being known as a drummer who's contributed a lot, done a lot of work, I don't carry that over and and see through the lens of a drummer, you know. Mm -hmm. I see through the lens of my heart and hmm. who I am as a person. Maybe a creative person, you know, see my, through as my uh, the lens as an artist. That's how I see. But as a drummer, I don't see it. So what I, I don't talk about, like, the, look at the rhythm there. But I will have graphic scores that will have things that may mm. express rhythm. Something specifically, my X's and dots thing from my book that has graphic notation that I created. But other times there might be just graph, uh, you know, sort of mechanical drawing sort of symbols and things that I could say that's a rhythm. But I, but, but I, I don't because... I don't want to limit the person's interpretation. So as a visual artist, it's really important to me. And as a, as a composer, the last thing I want to do is tell them what they're hearing or what they're seeing. I want them to tell me what they're seeing. I'm more interested in what they're seeing. So I don't want to say, hey, look, there's rhythm. Hmm. I want to say, hey, look, those could be, that could be a, a spectrum of tonality. Hmm. Whether it's asymmetric or symmetric, it's just there scattered across the the page the paper the canvas the screen i'm interested in what they're getting out of it you know that to me is what it's about and i think that's what true truly what art becomes it's activated by the receiver you know yes. otherwise it's just static it's just sitting there waiting for some interaction it's the interaction between the receiver so i'm um, like i like to leave things open even with titles you know um, yeah you know, like titling something, 
try to be careful about being very specific about what it means in a title. Because it could inform somebody's relationship with the work. Yeah, I may want someone to think about that subject. Like I made that record, that my first solo record, solo drumming, percussion yes. record, was Black Elk Speaks. I named it Black Elk Speaks because I was extremely inspired by the prophetic message of Black Elk's words how important I feel it is for people to just read that point of view. It's like turning everything we've learned upside down. I wanted people to think, what is Black Elk? Black Elk Speaks, and this is a book, you know, and it's like... Uh, there are some interpretations of the chapters that I kind of, then I get a little bit more like, this is the storm, six grandfathers, there's like a storm that has, there's a vision that he has. But in general, I'm not like that. I'm not like narrative. It's more like, I want to hear your narrative. Like, what do you hear when you hear me play a drum solo or you hear a composition or you see uh, artwork of mine? You know, what, what do you see? What do you hear? How does it make you feel? It just expands it more and it becomes personal that's what I like about it too it's like someone's personal experience with your work you know I'm just not into controlling people's minds I like to freeing them and you know having them think for themselves with kindness in their hearts it's really refreshing to talk to you right now about all of this because you're very concerned with and you think deeply about making art and people's relationship with it. And this year in particular has forced even the freest artists to sort of revisit their relationship with their work because so many of us have had to stay at home, isolated, and the outlets for our work have been limited and touring is not really an option what has it been like for you? I mean, how have you confronted the last 10 months? I've confronted it head on. I mean, I've just like, I'm like accepting all this, you know, unfortunate stuff uh, in a sense with open arms. I mean, maybe more like one is this and one is that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Give it to Come. me and yeah. <laughs> okay, back off, you know, which is like a mythological kind of symbol. But um yes. Uh, open arms, like just accepting it. And, you know, to me, I think what what I've also learned uh, in these 57 years on the planet is it's about surviving these terrible experiences that we have and how you stand up to it, how you use these situations for better. Like, what do we learn from it and how do we, how can we move forward? And the acceptance of it and so for me, it's been... That's the general idea, right? Is like trying to be like, well, it's happening. I can't control this. So I'm going to just wear a mask. I'm going to be careful. I'm not going to infect my 94-year-old dad and my 87-year-old mom. And I'm going to be very strict about it so that I'm not like, you know, even if it is, even if it was a, uh, what did they call it? You know, it's a hoax. Yeah. Even if it was a hoax, I'm being safe, you know, <laughs> like I'm wearing my seatbelt I'm actually voluntarily like wearing the mask. Okay, so that's part of it. Lock down as much as I can, go out when I need to, be safe, be careful, and just go deeper. You know, it's been very introspective time. It's been redefining time. And some people are not prepared or conditioned for this thing. Being an artist, it's easier for an artist to accept this and to go deeper and to get the solitude and to take a break and just to kind of watch this and learn from it. And a lot of it has been going deeper inside of myself and seeing like, what do I want to do after this? Or what, you know, how do I see things going forward? And, you know, what's important to me? And so it's just been more defining, you know, self-defining personal work for me. And it's actually been fruitful just as far as like feeling the sincerity of who I am is just even more apparent and I feel like I feel good about myself. I don't feel mm. great about myself because there's so much more I can do, especially when it has to do with, you know, equal rights and all that. It's just horrible and I feel terrible and I, okay, mm. the white guilt and all this stuff. It's like, yes, it's like for real. It's like as much as I feel like part of like a more inclusive culture, 
I'm fooling myself. It's not like that, you know, I'm privileged. So those realities have been really hard, really harsh. I've come face to face with some very humiliating moments, you know, of just, oh my God, like, who do I think I am? And like, I have so much to learn and, you know, all those things. So it's been a lot of, you know, the reckoning and, you know, but as an artist and just kind of seeing people, I'm, you know, I'm always trying to see the human condition Two eyes, one nose, one mouth, you know, this is like a Zen thing, right? It's just like that. We all got it. Mm -hmm. That's on the level that I want to deal with things. But we have a lot of work to do. So it's hard because an artist getting political and all that, it's like, how do I go forward? And it has to be addressed. But sometimes I think it can happen in the power of the intention and of the example. And just casually following your Instagram page and the, the little pieces of yourself that you put out in the world, what I do see is that you are committed to being productive. When you describe using whatever is coming at you, I th almost think of it as like energy that can be harnessed in any number of ways, you know, and you, you're you harnessing it into making light boxes and lamps and you're <laughs> harnessing it into making visual art and you're harnessing it into just literally sharing your process of practicing and what you're getting into. And somehow by just showing that all of this work happens in these small incremental ways of just waking up and doing it, there is something very positive that is expressed through that, I think. Yeah, thank you. I think that's, that's my work, and especially seems to be just naturally evolving and defining itself through Instagram in particular, this format for me works really well because I can share the developmental stages, some things that are happening, the process, and being very as generous as I can be about who I am, and being sincere too, yeah. you know, um, not censoring or editing like too much, but of course getting the best of maybe something yeah. is nice, but it's also the best mistake or the best like combination of things, like not perfect. And that message to me is just about, that's really about empowering other people. Like I really want, I really want them to see themselves in what I'm doing and, ma and make them go, I want to do that. Yeah. You know, and I think part of the problem is that people are so selfish. They don't even want to share their ideas at the, be at the early stages because they think someone's going to steal them. And that's true. Sometimes I think about that, but other times I'm like, they'll never develop it in the direction that I'm going to go in. I mean, and if they did, that would be an incredible coincidence. But like, it just doesn't happen. Like people may say, I'm going to take that thing that he did and I'm going to write a song. And it's like, you know, part of me is flattered. The other part is like, hey, do your own thing. But at the same time, it's like, whatever motivates people, go for it, you know, take that idea and make it your own, you know. So it's empowering other people and sharing that, you know, trying to be honest about it. That feels really good. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, well, it feels good to experience it also. It's nice to pass through your Instagram page and pick something new up. Thanks uh, for letting me know. It's good to hear. Social media in general, and Instagram in particular, it operates on so many levels, right? Like you as a visual artist and as a creative person and as a teacher, you know, you really recognize it as a tool for creative expression. It's also a great place for me to show you what I had for lunch yesterday or for me to promote a gig or for, you know, a family member to show a picture of a of a child or anything. I mean, it sort of exists, the same tools that you have, everybody has, and we're all using it in our own personal way. Exactly, and I think it's a creative outlet. It's, it's, a, it's a creative platform, yep. right? It's a stage for everybody. It's, a, it's a, like, you know, uh, the closest thing I can think of this is a television series. <laughs> you know, these little minute little yeah. things that you can express, and it's just like, you don't know when it's going to pop up, but like, oh, there it is, there's another yeah. thing, and it's just like evolving and devolving, whatever it's doing, it's like, it yeah. kind of creates this crazy narrative, like, you know, unconscious, playful narrative yeah. that anybody can do, and I think that uh, some people just don't really embrace it, and other people do, and other people use it for the wrong reasons or whatever negative reasons. And there's so many ways to use it. Uh, and I think that it doesn't hurt. It, yeah, it certainly doesn't hurt that I'm a visual person. Yeah. Because if it's so visual, you can see how people respond to visual things more than the words or like, you know. But I'm trying to continue to just be as open I can about not thinking about like, what effect is this going to have on most people? It's like, no, it's really coming from me. What am I excited about? Yeah. 
what am I truly passionate about that I really want to share this weird thing that just happened or this like yeah. cool thing that I'm doing. That's all. It's just like being able to share that. And, and it's being, a, and my wife pointed it out. You know, she's like, it's about being a performer. You're a performer. You like to perform. And the opportunities for public performance have changed. So this is the stage right now. Yeah, the touring thing for me is, has been kind of over in the past five years anyway, because it's been so grueling and my boys are yep. late teens. Well, my oldest is 20 and my other one's 17. And like, I missed a good part of their lives being on the road so much. So I'm trying to get that back before they really fly the, fly the nest, you know? <laughs> so I'm, um, enjoying being able to perform this way mm -hmm. and have an yeah. outlet and not have to travel and be away from them and sharing the things that I do at home. You know, I love it. I love, yeah. you know, having the things around me to just pick up. I can't do that on a tour bus on an airplane in a hotel room. It's an entire aesthetic universe that you are in and that we see little slivers of. I'd love to talk to you about the record a go-go that Modesky Martin Wood made with John Schofield. That record, it's a long time ago now, but uh, that record is a classic. It holds up so beautifully. And I remember when I first heard it, how much I loved it and how much I listened to it and how fresh it seemed and funky and unique. My dad and I listened to it together a lot. He loves it still and listens to it still. When I go home to visit him, we still listen to it together. It, wow, what an honor. What memories do you have of that project? What was that experience like for you? I'd just love to hear your version of that. I met John Schofield twice uh, before that, way before that, and it was through Bob Moses, you know. First time was when I, we were working on a Gramavision record, uh, Bob Moses working on a record, and he was kind of, it was kind of like a developmental record. He had a vision, oh, actually, no, it ended up on Visit with the Great Spirit, I think. And he had Jocko come over and play over this Brazilian stuff. So that's like when I, I was like part of the Brazilian percussion track with my teacher and another incredible percussionist. Moses wasn't happy with what Jocko did, so he had Schofield come in and I met him and he was very nice. I was like, wow, this guy's so cool and nice and like he just laid all these tracks and that was it. And then another time we were, I was playing with Bob Moses' Mozamba band, I think it was called, at Berkeley, and it was a double bill with Schofield and I think he was doing like one of those records like either Blue Matter or but uh, but th mm -hmm. then I kind of like, wow, that's, that's John Schofield. And I liked uh, his records. Like I had a couple of his records he did on Gramavision. And I, and I, and I, I really dug them like with Omar Hakim and yeah. with all these different, a couple of different drummers. And so I was familiar with Schofield and uh, admired him from a distance. Uh, when we were in Hawaii with Nessie Martin Wood, we got a call on our, at the time we had a band line before there was email or internet. We had a phone line where you could leave a message for the band, and Schofield called the number. And it's a famous story that John and Chris tell better because they were there. They went into town, so you have to drive seven miles out of the jungle where the shack is to go shopping. And you call your answering machine when you get there to see how what's the rest of the world doing, you know. And uh, they checked our band message and was like, hey, this is John Schofield. Really love you guys and love to, like, talk about maybe making a record or like doing something together and so john and chris came back and they're like somebody laid a crank call saying they were john schofield <laughs> and uh, uh, so it, it didn't at the first it didn't take it seriously the first time uh, eventually we realized it wasn't the couple of uh clowns friends of medeski's making a crank call called them back I just lost. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording. Did your, <laughs> did your phone die? It did, yeah. 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 So I'm, I apologize for that. What I was saying was that John Schofield left us a message on our uh, band answering machine in the 90s, uh, wherever that was, before we made a go-go, and we didn't believe it was him for a little while and then we finally realized it was him we called him back and he was really nice and he just basically was like hey i got some you know i would just want to do anything with you guys i just love your band and i just would love to play with your band so he's like hey maybe we can make a record you know and we were like okay cool but we're not comfortable like writing the music hmm. like 
we'd rather you just write the music and have us just play. It'll make it easier. Somehow we came up with that decision. But he did approach us in a very open way, you know. And now, you know, these days we've been doing writing both like it's been a co collaboration. But um, with the Go Go, it was his his tunes. He just gave us some sheet music, you know, a head and some chords. And we just basically rehearsed once or twice in Carol's studio. Uh, and then we went right into Power Station, I guess it was, and recorded it in one day. It was a very natural, comfortable, easy flow. It was really just like us just basically adapting, you know, uh, you know, uh, arrange. We really were like the arrangers. Let's just say that. You know? He just gently, just humbly, you know, gave us these charts and we, we worked them out together. It was probably one of the easiest sessions we had done with anybody and that's why it sounds so good. Plus, he's just such a pleasure to play with because he's such a, a master in his own right, obviously. And also his sense of rhythm, for me, that personal connection with him is so easy to play with him. He also kind of has this way of writing in a way that he knows what could probably work better than other things. So he's going to like write for that situation. So that really lended itself to the great record. Did you feel that being associated with SCO changed anything for the, you know, your audience? What I remember is how people responded so strongly. Certain people were just like, it was so, such a powerful thing that they related to. Like, yeah. it was like, and they let us know. Yeah. And that, and then some people were like, that record brought them to us. Yeah. They, there was a lot of that. So, so I was made aware of that, but I wasn't thinking about like, Oh, is our, has our audience changed? Or right. like, you know, of course, it opened up our ability to book tours like European jazz festivals and stuff and U.S. jazz festivals like to be able to do, you know, have that opportunity to, to play this music was really easy to get those gigs. Uh, right. I just love that it was John was so 100 percent be you and then just meeting him that short distance between us and his music you know it was just worked out great well speaking of working out great billy martin thank you for this conversation this has just been great is there anything you want to talk about before we wrap it up no we'll just pick up the next time if you know meet up again sometime and continue i would love it man it's really been such a pleasure thank you leo thanks billy take care all right, all right. take care man bye there he was, my friends, Billy Martin. What a deep-thinking cat. Loved talking to him. I'll be back in your ear pods before you know it with another deep dive in Dubly. Until then, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs>